Okay. Hi guys. So we're going to wait for a couple minutes, see if more people come in. Um, in the meantime, I'll send out a poll and if you guys could just finish that, that'd be good. Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to week two of Python programming. Um, last week was kind of weird. We had issues with Zoom, so hopefully this week will be much more streamlined. Okay, so again, this is our course overview. This is what we're gonna be learning um, the next couple of weeks. Last week, we finished print statements. We did variables and we did the basic data types and Today, we're going to focus on lists, slicing, and tuples. OK, so today's agenda, we're going to go over the examples um, that we didn't get to last week. And we'll just do some quick review, go over lists and some methods for lists, then go into slicing and then tuples, and then do a short demo, and maybe um, some examples as well. Um, we also have homework this week. So for homework, it's on a document and you can just create your own REPL and do um, the problems and make sure you comment out which problem it is. And then next week, we'll go over the answers for those homework questions.
Um, so now we'll work on the practice problems. So um, let me just share my screen. So these are the practice problems from last week. And um, yeah, let's. Um, can you see my screen? Okay, so these are the um, practice problems from last week. So the first one is write code that displays, um, so that it displays my first program adds two numbers, seven and six. So for this, we'll be writing in um, input statement. So first we have to assign that input statement to a variable. So let's say um, num, and then we say input, and then we add the prompt. So um, my first program has two numbers, seven and six. And then for this, um, Oh wait, sorry, my bad. It's not an input. Um, you just um, so it displays a string, and then um, after and then it prints the correct value. So num, and then this is a string, and then we would say um, let's say the next variable is sum. So we would do seven plus six. And print um, um, and then we would say string sum. That's like one way to do it. An easier way to do it would just be print. Um, and when you add this to here, and then you would say comma string um, sub. So it's either like using a variable or not. And then you add this, and you get um, 13. So, yeah. Okay, the next problem is um, identify and remove the illegal characters in the variable name to my dash first underscore name is equal to John. So like we um, discussed last week, we can't have integers or any other characters, any other character besides an underscore um, in a variable name as those would make it an illegal variable. So to make it a legal variable, um, we can, place the two at the end or we can remove the two. So you can say my, and then it, we can't have the dash. So we have to replace, let's say we can replace the dash with an underscore and this will be legal. And then say first name to John. And then as you can see, this has an error. See, it says invalid syntax. Well, this one is valid. Okay, um, so for the next problem has um, two parts. So write a code that prints out a true Boolean value when comparing the variables X and Y. So the first one is X is equal to 25 and Y is equal to 30. So in order for this, um, in order for it to print true, we could um, say that X is less than Y since 25 is less than 30. Or we could say y is greater than x. And those both of those statements would be true. So we could say um, less than y. And then we could also say y is like the same thing. Um, we could also like we could also say um, instead of just using a less than or greater than sign here, we could say less than equal to because 
less than equal to is like saying less than or equal to. So um, if it's less than or equal to, it will um, check if either of those um, statements are true. And so that would also print true since x is less than y. But it doesn't necessarily have to be equal to y, if that makes sense. Okay, and then all of these would print to true. Uh, whoops, let me comment that out. Oh, x is not. And then true, and then another statement that would be true um, would be not equal to, because 25 is not equal to 30, so that would also print true. Yeah. And then for the next one, um, we could say that um, it's essentially like we could, it's the opposite of the first one, at least the first four statements. So um, it would be x is greater than y, and then, or y is less than x. And that goes for the same thing for the greater than equal to and then less than equal to. And then x is not equal to y. And like we said, um, so x and y would be these values instead of 25 and 30, because when we're um, working with variables in Python, you can use the same variables and it will reassign those variables with the um, most current or current value as it goes through the code. So yeah, as we can see, all of these are printing true. And then the last one is what does the code output? So for this, we like we're not trying to actually code it, but um, we have to think what is being outputted. So the first one is um, three to the power of two is equal to string value nine. So the first one would be um, false because three to the power of two is int value nine which is not equal to string value nine because those are two different types. So this one would be false. And we can just check this um, using code. So we'll just say that's false. So we know. And then um, next one will be um, two modulus three is equal to question mark. So does anyone have any idea what this would be? I guess, oh. So two modulus three would mean like two remainder three. So um, since two is not divisible by three and um, like, so then it would be remainder two because um, when you divide two by three, you get zero and then remainder two. So that's so two modulus three. So this would print two. And then the last one is one plus two times three divided by 4.0. So we have to remember um, order of operations or PEMDAS. Um, and that, so Python follows that. And so we would first have to start with um, the multiplication. Um, so that'll be two times three, which is six, and then divided by 4.0 would be so that's uh, uh, 1.5. 
and then plus one would be 2.5. So let's just copy that statement. And again, um, so since we're dividing um, an integer by a float, so then that makes the um, resulting a quotient a float instead of an integer. Yeah, and as we can see, it prints false two and then two point five like we said. So those are all the practice problems. So let me stop. Okay, cool. Um, so let's move on to a quick review and then we'll go into our topics for today. So last week we did print statements. So print statements are just displaying the value of a string or whatever you put inside the print statement to the console. Um, variables are objects that are assigned a value and the names are case sensitive. Like we went over, you can't use dashes or you can't start with a number or stuff like that. Um, we went over the four basic data types. So string, which um, is represented by str, integer represented by int, floating point or decimal represented by float, and boolean, which is true or false represented by bool. Um, also basic arithmetic um, expressions. So we have plus, minus, multiplication, floating point division. So remember there's a difference between floating point division and quotient or just regular division. So when we have floating point division, it will always return the decimal value of that division. So it will do the actual um, division when you put it into Python. But then when we have um, the quotient or just um, division, then it'll return the whole number without that remainder decimal. Um, so it's always an integer. Um, and then we have um, exponential um, and remainder or modulus. Um, and then last but not least, we have comparisons where these expressions will either evaluate to true or false, which are both Boolean values. Um, these are some example um, comparisons. Okay, so now we'll move on to some new material. So first, um, we'll be talking about lists. So um, essentially lists are um, like, are variables that store multiple items or they, yeah. And then the syntax would be square brackets. And so list items are ordered and this um, order doesn't change. So the first list item would be zero and then one, two, three, four, going on to the last one. So the essentially the length of the list would be um, yeah, that would be the length minus one since I start, since the last index would be length minus one since it starts at zero. And then when adding items to a list, they're placed at the end of the list. And they're also, um, lists can be changed. So you can add or delete or um, like move items in a list. And it also allows duplicate values. Um, and then, List items can be of any data type and can contain multiple data types. Like for example, it can have both strings and integers and Boolean values in one list and that um, there would be no error. Um, and then accessing items in the list, like I said, um, you access them with the index that is associated with that value. So either from zero to um, where the end of the list, whatever number the end of the list is, which would be len minus one. And you can change the value of an item by redefining it. And like I said, um, you can use len to find the size of the list. And yeah, and you can use the in keyword um, to check if an item exists in a list. Uh, 
Um, so more on lists. So um, you can insert items in a new list with um, basically without replacing any of the values by using the insert method. So um, what this would do is you would um, define a specified um, index you would want the object or value to be inserted at. And so um, if it's like, say, in the middle of a list, say like um, index one, so it will be inserted index one. And from index um, in the original list from index one onwards, um, those will be moved one down. So for example, um, for apple, banana, cherry is the list. And then you want to insert watermelon at, um, let's say, index two. So um, it will result in apple, banana, watermelon. And then cherry, which was originally at index two, will be moved down and will now have index three. Um, and then to add an item to the end of the list, you can use the append method, which would essentially just, yeah, as like apple, banana, cherry, and then you append orange. So that will go at the end. And we'll have index of len minus one. Um, to append elements from another list to the current list, you can use the extend method. So this is kind of like, um, <clears throat> kind of like adding two lists together. So um, you would say, if you want um, to add tropical to this list, so then you would say this list.extend um, tropical in parentheses. And then removing items, you can either use um, the remove method or pop method. So remove takes in a specific, specified item as an argument and removes it from the list. So essentially it will take um, the value, like not the in and not the index, um, while pop takes in the index and will um, remove the item from the list. Um, another thing to note is pop, if you say, let's say you save it to a variable. So pop returns um, whatever value it um, removes. So you can like use that. And if you want it later on, you can just save it to a variable and it will save whatever value that you removed from the list. Um, sorting lists, you can use the sort method and it will essentially um, sort the list based on numeric values. So for example, here, um, it's um, this list has string values. But um, so string values also have numeric values in that each letter has a specific numeric value. So essentially here it is, um, alf it is organized alphabetically since that's um, how each letter is, um, has a number is alphabetical. Um, so these are the useful methods for lists. Um, we already went over um, a few. So we already went over append, um, insert, pop, remove, sort. And some other ones include clear. So this just removes all the elements from a list and it creates, essentially creates an empty list. Copy, um, this returns a copy of the list. Count returns the number of elements um like within um with the specified value so let's say you want to see how many of a certain value is there then you would use count and it would essentially print out how many of those values are present in the list and then extend like we said um adds um the elements of the list to the end of a current list um index returns index of the first element with a specified value. So essentially you would say index and then in parentheses, whatever value you want. And this will return the index of that value. Um, we already talked about insert, pop, remove, reverse. So essentially it's like the opposite of sort. It, uh, or not the opposite per se, but it'll reverse the order of the list. So um, whatever was, um, at the end will now be in the front.
Okay, so now we're going to go over slicing. So when we have a list and we want to take specific values from that list or a range of values from that list, we can do something called slicing. So slicing is um, a subsequence of a sequence, which is called a slice. So whatever range of values that is, that's a slice of that list or tuple or whatever it is. Um, and we use square back brackets as the operator um, but instead of one integer value where we would just want one um, value, instead of saying like, oh, I want in my list, give me bracket the fourth index, we would use a colon to say we want from this range to this range inside of this list. Um, so when you slice a sequence, the resulting subsequence always has the same type as the sequence from which it is derived. So this is a little um, complicated, but basically when you slice a list, that slice is always going to be a list, if that makes sense. Because, um, but if you were to use like just an index value without a colon inside the brackets, that's just the value of whatever that, um, that thing is inside of the list. So this is not, so yeah, again, it's not generally true with indexing, except in the case of strings. So when we were, when we're slicing strings, we would do the same thing. We'd have a string assigned to a variable and we'd say bracket, we want this index. But we can also say we want this index of this index using a colon. And so in this case, slicing and both indexing would give you a data type of string. So here's an example. Um, we'll go over this in the demo as well. But basically, it just shows that when you have in, when you want the index zero of this strange list, then you get this tuple one comma two, and then when you want zero to one, which in this case one is not included when you slice, so it's just the index zero. So that's the same value, but since it's slicing, it's inside of a list. So it doesn't matter if it's only one value, zero values, or like any number of values, it's always going to be of type list. Okay, and so tuples. So list and tuples we're going over today, they're both data types. Um, so tuple is the second data type where it's written with round brackets or parentheses instead of square brackets. And tuples are used to store multiple items in a single variable. And the difference between tuples and lists is that in like coding terms, I don't know, um, lists are mutable and tuples are immutable. So when we say lists are mutable, that means that the values can be changed once the list is defined. So you can change, let's say you wanna change like the second index value, you can say, list of second index is equal to whatever you want to change it to. But for tuples, you can't change those specific values once it's defined. And you can't add or remove items after the tuple has been created. So tuples are unchangeable, so you can't add or remove items for them, but you can use a workaround, which is basically using the list, um, the list method to change the tuple to a list and then you can change it back to a tuple. So there's also something called unpacking tuples. So we'll get more into this when we learn about classes and objects. But basically when an object returns something, it can return a tuple, but then it'll inside the tuple, there are multiple things that you would want to use maybe later on. So what you can do is you can unpack that tuple by assigning each of those values two different variables. So in this example, we can extract the values back into variables. So we have a tuple called fruits and it has three strings, apple, banana, cherry. And we want to unpack it and stream it into these three variables, green, yellow, and red. So we would just say, in this case, we don't necessarily need the parentheses for green, yellow, and red, but we would just say green comma yellow comma red is equal to fruits and then it'll give you um, the specific values in that order. And let's say we want um, the first two values to be variables, um, or the first two variables to be um, like one value, and then the last variable to just be a list of the rest of the um, values. So we can say green, yellow, and then asterisk red, 
which basically just means stream the rest of the um, tuple into this variable. So we would, green would be apple, yellow would be banana, and then red would just be a list of cherry, ra strawberry, raspberry. And you have to make sure you have to remember that when we're doing asterisks, that means that we want a list of the rest of the um, values, not a tuple. We're not going to get a tuple from that. And so there are two um, methods um, for tuples. There's the count method where it returns, again, the number of times a specific value occurs in a tuple or the number of instances. And then index, it searches a tuple for a specific value and then returns the index of that value. And if you have multiple um, of those values inside of a tuple, it will just return the first um, index of that value. Okay, so we're gonna go on to examples. Let me share my REPL. Um, and we're kind of, we might end a little early, so we can probably go over, you start the homework as well. Okay. Okay, um, can everybody give me a thumbs up if they can see my screen or if it's too small, let me know in the chat. Okay, cool. Okay, so We'll go over a short demo. So let's say we have a list called values. And let's say this list has five values of one, two, three, four, and five. So let's say, so when we use slicing, we can get just the entire list by saying values and then brackets colon. So basically, because there's no values between or in the beginning of the colon or after the colon, it'll just give you the entire list. So it's the exact same as saying print values. And so let's say we want the second index. So in this case, starts at zero. So one is the zeroth index, two is the first index, three would be the second index. Let's say we want three through five. So in this case, there's two ways of doing this. We can say values bracket, and we can say from two to, what is the last, three, four. So we, in this case, we would say fifth index because the last index is always one minus that. So we never include the last index after the colon. So if we print that, we get three through five. But another way of doing this is just saying values brackets to colon, and that's it. So when we don't specify a value at the end of a colon or after the colon, it just assumes that we want to go until the end of the list. So you print that out, it's the same thing. Um, let's say we want to go up until three. So we want one, two, three. So we can slice it like the same way. There's two ways of doing it. You can either do um, it? zero through three, because remember, this is the second index. So three is not included. So it'll return until the second index. So one, two, three. And then we can also say oh, three. And that returns the same thing. It assumes that if you don't have anything before the colon, you just want to start at the zero index. There's also um, two colons. And basically what two colons means is the first in the first value that you would write before the colon would be the starting index. We know that, right? And then after the colon is the ending index. So Let's say we want to start at one and we want to end at the third index or four because four is not included. 
if we do another colon, the value after that is the step. So that's how many times you would skip. So let's say we want to skip by two each time. We would just say two and then it would print out two and four. So it basically skips one and then goes to the next one, if that makes sense. So you can put any value into the step here. Um, if you don't, like here, we didn't have that second colon. So that means that it just assumes that we want to go by step one. Um, and then you can also have no values for oops, the previous colon. So we can say just the entire list, which is just colon, and then colon again, step two. And that print 135. Okay, hopefully this makes sense. And then we can also do negative values for the step. And negative values basically means we want to go backwards through the list, but with that certain step. So we can do the same thing as we did for this one. So we can say values one through four, but we want to go backwards by two. So it'll just return this list backwards. I think it's that one. Oh no, this list backwards. Oh, what happened? Okay, it's fine. I'll just do this. So, yeah. So basically, it went by negative two. So each step was going backwards um, twice, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, so we went over a couple methods. I think some of the most important ones or the ones that you'll use the most are append and pop. So append, if we remember from the slides, is just adding a value to the end of the list. We're not um, giving it any, we don't want to insert it into any specific index. It just appends to the end of the list. So we would just say, if we want to append like six to this list, we would say values.append six, we could print values and then we'll see that six is appended to the end. Yeah. And then there's also pop, which we mentioned before and pop is different from remove because it not only removes that index value, but it will return that value. So you can assign that to a variable in case you want to use it later in your code. So you can say two is equal to values.pop index one. So this should return this value while also removing it from the list. Two and then print. Yeah, so two now has the value two because that's the index or that's the value at index one and then the list now looks like this, where the two is removed from the list. There's also um, sorting. So we didn't go over one of the other methods to sort, um, but there's two methods to sort a list and there's a key difference between the two. So let's say we have this random list of numbers and we want to sort it. There's two ways we could do it. So one way we could use the sort method that we learned about in the slide. So we can say numbers.sort. And if we print numbers, we get the sorted list, right? Um, but we can also do sorted. So this sorted function looks a little different. We say sorted numbers. So this does the same thing. It sorts the whatever is inside of numbers, but there's gonna be a difference. So if I run this, you see it's not working. And the reason why it's not working is because it's not changing the original list. It's just returning a copy of the list that's sorted. So in this case, if we want the sorted list, because that's why we want to use sorted, we would have to assign it to a new variable or we can reassign it to the same variable. So we can say nums is equal to sorted numbers and then we can print nums. 
and then we would have the sorted list. So that does that make sense? So if you want to change the original list, you would use the dot sort method. But if you would, if you just want like a copy of the list, you don't want to change the original list, you can use a sorted function. Okay. So let's go over the difference between slicing and indexing. So if you remember the strange list from before, I'll just copy paste it. So we have this strange list and it has um, a tuple, a list inside of a list. It has a string, it has an integer, it has a floating point. So a lot of different data types going on here. But let's say we want the zeroth index of the list. So we could use slicing. We could say strange list. And then we want the zeroth index, and then one is not included. So it'll only give us the zeroth index. So that would give us that tuple one, two. And then we can print the type. We can also just use the index method of just getting the zeroth index of the list. So that would just be brackets zero, and we can print the type. So before I run this in the chat, who, um, if you think there's a difference between these two, tell me what the difference is. If you think it's the exact same thing, especially type, think about the type. If you think it's the exact same thing, then tell me it's the exact same thing. So tell me in the chat, is it the same? If it is, what are the types? If it's different, then what are the types for each one? No one? Okay. So basically when we slice, we're, we want a range of values from a specific list or tuple or whatever it is. So that range means that it'll always return a type list, no matter how many values are inside of that list. So in this case, we only wanted one value, which is this tuple. So we said we want zeroth index and then one is not included, but because we're slicing, that means that this type will be a list. In this case, we're only looking for one value inside of the list, which is the zeroth index. And that is this tuple. So the type would just be the type of that value. So if you run this, yeah. So you see here, there's brackets around it since it's a list, but there's only one value in it. And then that's class list and this is class tuple. Okay, so we can also go over changing lists into tuple so that we can use um, list methods. So this is a workaround of having tuples because tuples can kind of be annoying. So let's say we have a tuple of these three strings, apple, banana, cherry, and then we want to remove apple from the tuple but it's a tuple, we can't change it. So Oh yeah, okay. I just got a message in the chat. Yeah, if it's your first day here, that's totally fine. Um there was no class last week, so the week before, um there is a recording and it's on the document that I can show you guys later. Yeah. Okay, cool. So we have a tuple, apple, banana, cherry. We want to remove apple, but because we're dealing with tuples, it's immutable. We can't add, remove, or change any of the indexes or any of the values inside of the tuple. So we would have to change it into a list 
and then remove apple and then change it back to tuple. So we would do this by saying, I don't know, y is equal to list of tuple. So that successfully changes tuple into a list. We say y dot remove. And so when we use remove, we don't put the index, but we instead put the value that we want to remove. Pop, we would put the index of that value. Um, and then we can say tuple is equal to tuple y. And then type. So if we run that, we have the tuple banana cherry and it's a class tuple. And then let's say we have a list of fruits, apple, banana, cherry, strawberry, raspberry, and we want to unpack this tuple. Oh, sorry, it's not a list of fruits, it's a tuple of fruits. So we wanna unpack this tuple. So we can, again, we would assign five variables in the beginning and then say equal to fruit. So we would say green, yellow, red, pink, We'd say that's equal to fruits. So each of the values consecutively are assigned to each of the variables. So we can print, I'm not gonna write these print statements. So we can print each of these values. Let me see what we get. Yeah, so we have apple, banana, cherry, strawberry, raspberry in that order. And then let's say we want apple and banana because they're because it's green and yellow, and then we want cherry, strawberry, raspberry, because they're all shades of red. So we can say green, yellow, and then we could do asterisk red. So asterisk means take whatever is left inside that tuple and pour it into red. So in this case, when we do asterisk red, that means create a list. It's not a tuple, it's a list of the remaining values. And then we can say is equal to. We can print these. Yeah, so we have apple, banana, and then a list of cherry, strawberry, raspberry. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, that's the end of our demo. I think we'll start the homework. The homework is pretty easy. I think you guys can handle it. Um, we'll work on it for about five minutes. And then if you guys have any questions you can ask, um, yeah, please stay on the call until like two o'clock and then I'll answer any questions regarding the homework. So let me put this in the chat. So this is the homework. If you can open it and view it, give me a thumbs up in, in the, on your Zoom. And then start working on that. And I will...
Also, if you guys finish the homework by two, let me know. And then we can maybe go over some of the problems.
Okay, so it is 1.58. I think we'll go ahead and end here for today. Um, thank you guys for coming. If you guys are staying for the machine learning lecture, then go ahead and stay. If you're not, then have a great week and see you next week. Next week, um, we'll be going over loops, so for, if, while loops, and also maybe functions. All right. Make sure to do the homework as well. Bye, guys. All right, hi everyone. Um, we'll wait a couple minutes um, for people to come in and then we'll probably get started at around 2.05ish.
Okay, so it is 2.05, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to week two of machine learning. Um, today we kind of have quite a lot to talk about. Um, we're gonna go over types of machine learning. We're gonna go over pandas and numpy. So this is our table of contents. So first we're gonna start off with types of machine learning and then we'll go into types of supervised tasks, which um, will include classification versus regression. And then we'll do some terminology of supervised learning. And then we'll go into NumPy and um, we'll do arrays and indexing and array operations. And then we'll also go into pandas and we'll do some series data frames and go into that stuff. All right, Ashwin, you wanna take over? Sure. Hey everyone, my name is Ashwin. It's my first time here, but I'm excited to teach you guys. If you have any questions at all on any concept in this presentation, feel free to put it in the chat or send it to one of us. We'll be happy to answer them. So let's get started first with the types of machine learning. So there are two main types of machine learning, maybe a third extra one. The two main types are supervised learning and unsupervised learning. So let's break it down. Supervised learning is when we're given historical data and we're using it to predict either a class or a number, depending on what our problem is. And we'll get into that distinction in a second. So the main thing is that we train on a data set with labels, which correspond to metrics. And we're asked to predict what those labels will be when we're only given those metrics. That might sound confusing at first, but let's give an example to kind of illustrate that. Let's say you have a bunch of fruits that you want to classify, like apples, oranges, bananas, and then you see a fruit that you've never seen before. Your machine learning model will use supervised learning to classify what that new fruit is. Now, the second type of machine learning is called unsupervised learning. And no, it's not artificial intelligence taking over the world like the Terminator. In fact, it's when we're given a data set, but there's nothing to predict. So we're not really looking for past data and trying to predict anything, but we're just trying to look for patterns and similarities in the data. That means we can kind of group the data using something called clustering, where we can base them on similarity and patterns rather than a strict kind of prediction rule. Finally is reinforcement learning, which is used in more dynamic scenarios. It's basically when you give a model a reward or a punishment for doing an action correctly so that the machine learning model can successfully navigate through the specific scenario. So that's a brief overview. Now let, let's get into the two types of supervised tasks. The two main supervised tasks are classification and regression. Classification, as I mentioned before, is predicting what class or category something will be in, whether it be fruits, like apples, oranges, or it can be whether or not someone has a deadly disease or not. You can just imagine the wide range of applications classification can be used for. An example of binary classification is where there are only two categories to predict or two possible values. But on, there's also multi-class classification where there's multiple different categories. Let's say you're trying to classify a bunch of different types of flowers. That would be a multi-class classification problem. Now, regression, on the other hand, is not predicting categories, but it's predicting numbers in a continuous fashion. For example, you could use regression in like stock market analysis, predicting what the stock would be, let's say tomorrow, or housing prices could also be this, predicting monthly returns or predicting height. All of these are regression problems that this supervised task can solve. Now, just to understand supervised machine learning, there are two specific terms that you need to understand. First is features. What does that mean? It basically is the columns or metrics. Next is the target value, or you can call it the label. It's the name of the thing we're predicting. In this specific data frame, um, the features is the aircraft engine class, and it says jet. There could be other aircraft engine class, but this is the specific feature that we are controlling. And what we want to predict is the total distance traveled, which is essentially the dependent variable. And it's often expressed like X for features and Y for the target. Now let's talk about NumPy, which is a linear algebra Python library commonly used for data science. 
So this library is extremely and very commonly used. It's used for manipulating and storing data in arrays, which is useful for creating and using data from pandas data frames, which is also another library. Now, many libraries rely on and use NumPy architecture. So to really understand NumPy, we first need to get into the basics of arrays. Arrays are a really big part of NumPy and they can be used to contain things like numbers and strings. It's similar to a list, but they need to hide identical data types. They can also be used to contain lists, but a list of lists is called a matrix. One list that contains multiple lists is called a two-dimensional arrays or a matrix. Now, uh, np.array with the name of list as a parameter can be used to cast a list as an array. So remember the two key distinction, the one key distinction between list and array is that list can have any data type while arrays need to have one single data type. So here's some useful array methods. Now you don't need to memorize all of these. You can find them with like a quick Google search, look at the NumPy documentation for arrays. But these are some, you see, these are some of the ones you should know. First is np.arrange, which you can use to create a quick list of numbers arranged in linear fashion. Next is np.zeros, which just fills in a vector of zeros, or it can create a matrix of just a bunch of zeros. np.ones does the same as np.zeros, except it's ones. np.linspace creates an array of evenly spaced points between two numbers. Like if one uh, space all the numbers from zero to one by 0.2, you will get 0, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, et cetera. Then there's np.i, which creates a square matrix, which are all zeros except this diagonal line of points. I'll go through most of these through the demonstration at the end. Some more useful array methods, array.reshape, which just reshapes the array, maximum gets the maximum, minimum, argmax gets the index of the maximum value, argmin returns the index of the minimum value, array.shape returns the shape of the array, number of rows, number of columns, and finally, array.dtype returns the data type of the array. Now, indexing and operations. I think this is really important in arrays for you to be able to manipulate the data for what you want to do. So lists and arrays are indexed starting from zero. That's something you have to memorize because without it, you'll probably cause a lot of errors in your code. Matrices are indexed like the matrix, bracket, the row index first, and then the column index. Or you could use commas between the row and column. For example, let's say we have a matrix called the matrix. I know, very creative. So it has three separate arrays in it. So it's a three-dimensional array. The first array is one, two, three. Second array is four, five, six. The third array is seven, eight, nine. Now, if you want to call the specific index of this matrix, you would see in the second line, it has bracket zero, bracket zero. That means at index zero of the row, which means that's the array one, two, three, because that's index zero, you get the column index of zero, which is that very first number, which is one. Now, if you call just matrix one without specifying the column index, you just get that entire row, which is four, five, six. Hopefully that clears up how indexing works. Slicing works very similar to the index. So the slice notation is based on start, stop, step. So you put the start index, a colon, and then the stop index or the step index. So for example, if you try to call 0 colon 5, that returns the values from index 0 to 4, 1 to 4, 5. If you call just colon 6, it returns everything up to index 5, 1 to 4. And array 5 colon returns index 5 and everything after that. Slice notation can also be used in indexing matrices as well as vectors. There's a thing called broadcasting, which uses slice notation to change the values of certain values in an array. Let's say you have an array with values 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and then you call array 0 to 5 has to be 100. That means all of the elements from index 0 to index 4 will all be equal to 100. 
Now let's talk about some operations. Addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, all use the same syntax. So you, if you have an array of A with one, 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 B is one, one, two, you add them together, it will be element-wise addition. So one plus one, two, one plus one, two, and one plus two, three. Make sure to be wary of the dimensions of the matrix and also never divide by zero because you'll get an infinite value since dividing by zero is undefined. Now, pandas, what is it? Pandas is a library built off of NumPy and the two go hand in hand. It allows us to perform high level data storage and manipulation. It's really similar to Excel, but it has a lot more features and flexibility. Let's talk about panda series and pandas data frames. Panda series are comparable to NumPy arrays, but series can be indexed by labels like A, B, C, etc. It stores one dimensional data and very similar to NumPy arrays. Every series has indexes and data and the data can be anything. It's not limited to one type of data. Pandas data frames other, on the other hand are a collection of series. You can initialize them by reading in an input file and converting it into a pandas data frame. Common standard for input files are .csv files, and they're really good for storing data. Pandas data frame, they're two-dimensional data table made of multiple series. There's several commands you could use to manipulate these data frames. For example, df.head gives a quick snapshot of the data. df.info provides important details of the data set, df.shape outputs the dimensions of a data frame in a tuple in numbers of rows and numbers of columns. So you can see in this image how each column is structured and this is just how a data frame might look. So yeah, I went through these pretty quickly, but here's a recap of these common methods, .head, .info, .shape if you need. Next is accession. So df and the parameter column name, whichever the name of the column is, it returns the specific column in the form of a pandas series. So let's say you have a bunch of columns and you want to grab a specific column to like manipulate it or get the data or something. Then you would just have to type the column name and get that column. Um, here are a few data frame methods as well. This apply method is where you write out a function and with lambda notation. For example, if you want to split a certain string apart and create a new column, you do df and then the name of that new column equals df old column dot apply. And inside the apply function, you would input a lambda function, which is like an x dot split. So it essentially split it using this built in lambda function. So what this does is pick out the first word before the code. Now, when dealing with null values, which we'll frequently do since most data, most data sets aren't already cleaned out. So first you can count the number of null values using df.isNull. That returns a data frame with true and false values. And to get the count per column, you do df underscore is underscore null parentheses dot count. So you count all the null values to see how to deal with them essentially. So when you're dealing with these null values, you can either drop them or fill in missing values. To drop all of the null values, you do df.dropNA and make sure to specify axis equals one if you want to drop columns. And to fill them, you do df.fillNA and then number of whatever you want to fill it with. So I, I'll do a quick demonstration based on all of these concepts on how you can apply it. Give me one second to load it. Uh, can everyone see my screen? Sounds good. So first you can go to Google Collab, just a quick Google search and new notebook. 
this is just a really simple way to like start programming really fast without any additional setup. All right, so let's first import NumPy, which is the Python library I talked about as NP. Now, let's define an array, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The most basic array you can imagine. So you can call np.array on this data, and then you can see how it looks in the console. Uh, oops, typo. So yeah, that's our array. So now let's look at what happens when you put a wrong data type. So let's say you have a string within a bunch of numbers, and then you create an array. Okay. So it gives this weird data type. I'm not entirely sure what's going on there. So just usually just don't put the same data, a different data type within an array because it usually gives it there. Okay, let's look at a few of these methods. So dot arrange changes the array into a specific format. So if you look at these two arrays, which I will just print momentarily. Okay, so you get zero and one, and then you get one and three. So what this arrange method does, um, yeah, so that's what this arrange uh, method does. And then the next thing I want to show you is, hold on. Um, okay, yeah. So let's look at the np.zeros function. So, okay. Looks, so what the np.0 does is create a matrix based on the rows, columns, and a number of zeros in each array. So if, if you look here, since there's two rows, and then there's also two columns, but there's three zeros in each of the arrays, so that's what each of these parameters mean. Same thing with np.1s. So a quick demonstration. So if you do five, five, and five, you would also expect five rows, five columns, and five ones in each array. And that's exactly what we get. Cool. Now let's look at linspace. So let's define a variable. Lin space one ten. Okay, so we divide the space from one to ten into four different intervals. It works. So that's what Lin space does: is you specify an interval, you specify a start and end point, and you see this is one, ten, and there's four numbers in between. And finally, np.i, it kind of looks like an i, which is why it's called that. So it has everything zeros except this one diagonal line of flux. So those are the basic NumPy methods. Now let's look at more manipulations of an array. p.array, defined it. All right, let's look at the reshape. So what happens when we reshape this? Okay, so we got the one and two in its own array and the three and four in a separate array. So we made two groups of two elements each. That's what both of these parameters mean. Keep going with the array manipulation. Let's get the maximum value of the array. That's four. Let's get the minimum value of an array. One. Let's go the argmax. And 
the arg min. Oops. Zero, yeah. And then let's, the shape of the array should be four, since that's how many elements are in the array. Um, oh, yeah, it's not a method. Yeah, it's four. And the data type of the array should be integer, since all of these numbers are integers. And yeah, we get integer data type. Cool. So that, that was just a brief overview of all of the array methods that we discussed on this pretty simple array. But you can think of all the possibilities that you could use if this was a much bigger array of data. Now let's look at indexing operations that we can use to manipulate the data even more. So let's call index array np.arrange 0 to 1,000. And then you reshape this array. into 10 by 10, 10, and let's see this array. Okay. So this is all of the numbers from zero to 1,000. That's what np.arrange does. And then you reshape this into 10 by 10 by 10. So there's 10 elements in each array, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. 10 rows, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, and 10 columns, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10, yep. So that just shows you the power of these operations. You can create massive amounts of data in a few lines of code. Now let's look at the pandas library. So, so far, this is all numpies and for manipulating individual pieces of numbers. But let's, let's look how to manipulate data frames as a whole. So first, you import pandas, usually as PD. Let's run that. And then um, df equal PD CSV. Let's read a file. Um, okay, so let's look at this data frame. So yeah, this is just a CSV file that you can see yourself. It's California housing test, so it gives a lot of this data, longitude, latitude. It's basically a bunch of housing data. Um, Arjun has a question. He has his hand raised. Can you import a data set with uh, pictures instead of just values? Um, I think, yeah, you should be able to in pandas, although personally I haven't tried it out. But you can also use external CSV files like um, with images in columns, and that should work as well. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, the columns, longitude, latitude, housing median age, total rooms, bedrooms. It's just a bunch of housing data, like if you're trying to buy houses or something. So let's get the, oops, this should go down here. Yep, df.head. So yeah, this just gives the first few, first five call, first five rows of the data frame. So zero, one, two, three, four just giving you a snapshot of what the data would look like. Next, let's grab a specific column. Let's say latitude. And we get all of this. So 37.7 matches it, matches, matches. Yeah, so this is just the entire column of data and you grab it using this command right here. Um, and then we can get uh, specific values of the data as well. So let's do housing median age, grab that column, value counts. So it counts how many times the value appears. And if you wanna take the first five rows of this, 
you do head five and you get just a sample of the counts. So basically the five most, um, most frequent housing median ages. And then you can use D types to see what type of data type each column has. So it looks like all of the columns in our data frame are floating, floating point, which means they all have decimals basically. Okay. So let's let's see the actual median income. And then let's call this median income. And then remember, this is a lambda function. So dot apply. So we're create essentially what we're doing here is we're making a new column using spelled income wrong using this median income column and then we're applying a lambda function on so it can be anything you want let's say you want to multiply it by ten thousand or something so it would take all of the values in this column apply this lambda function of multiplying it by ten thousand and then it would create this column called actual median income uh, and then let's look at how the first five rows looks. So, so you can see the median income here. And then you see the actual median income is 10,000 times whatever this is. So we've successfully created a new column in the data frame using uh, existing, um, manipulating existing columns for new data essentially. All right, now there's probably gonna be some null values or some missing data that we're trying to eliminate or fill. So let's see if, so this gives false, false. So it's basically a bunch of Booleans. If there's a null value, looks like all of these are fine. So let's get the total number of null values and looks, Hey, look at that. All of them are zero, which means there are no null values in our entire data frame. So just in case there are any, you could always fill it using the fill NA method and say, this is null, just run it. Nothing's really gonna happen because we don't really have null values, but if you did have null values, you would fill it with this message instead. So it would have something instead, instead of being completely null value. Finally, let's look at median house value. And then value counts. Add 10. So we got the column median house value. We got the number of values of each median house value, how much each house would probably cost. And then we just got the first 10 rows and that gives most to least. Yeah, Arahan, you had a question. Um, how did you get this file? Is so, it just, was it just on your computer? Um, I'm pretty sure this specific file, California Housing Tests, anyone can access on Google Cola. Like there are a few kind of test data sets that you could see, but if you really wanted um, like your own data, you could always import that. So you download that data, you would put it in um, probably the same folder as this, and then you would read the CSV file here. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Arjun? Can, can you also do this locally on like a local, uh, what's it called? Uh, like, uh, like IntelliJ or something? Like an IDE? Yeah, yeah. you could do okay. this on IDE. I just find, so there's Google Colab. There's a lot of um, ways to run Python. There's, you could use Jupyter Notebooks as well, which is similar to Google Colab. IDEs, it would work, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't have, it would be a little different since you have all the code would be like in just one block so that you wouldn't have spacing, but you could, if you put it in the same, if you put the CSV file in the same directory, as your project file for Python, then you could import 
this uh, read the CSV file directly from the IDE as well. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So yeah, I feel like I went through that pretty fast, but this is a general overview of the types of machine learning. If you had any questions at all on any of the commands or using pandas data frames, because that's a really important concept. There's, and also using NumPy manipulations, feel free to ask. Um, we could go back to the slides if you need to, like to review something really fast, but overall, yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, Arjun, I'm just seeing your question in the chat. Can you explain np.arrange? Yeah, definitely. So np.arrange, all it did is create the numbers from zero to 1000. Um, it just generates all of this. So arrange, it just outputs all of the numbers from zero to 1000. It's you specified the range and then it gives you that. So if I were like change this like five to 50 maybe, and then I'll just comment this out for now. So yeah, it just gives you five to 40. So one below the ending value. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Cool. Um, okay, cool. Um, before we get to your question, Arhan, um, if you guys want to like try different files and like try and manipulate data, if you go to the little folder icon on your Google Colab on the left side, there is some sample data that Google Colab has provided you and you can um, import that data through Pandas and um, manipulate it, do whatever you want with it, try some methods. Yeah, and if you want to upload stuff, there's this little like file upload icon, yeah. And then you can upload data from your computer. Yeah, Arhan, you can go ahead. Um, I tried putting in the string for the California housing test, but it said no such file or directory. Um, I think, do you go to this uh, folder icon and then see if it's there first? Yeah, it is there. Okay. So in that case, I think you would need the full directory and not just the string. So do you have this section as well? Yeah. Um, is it like the same exact? I'm not sure. Maybe you could like paste your code in the chat. Just send it. Okay. Yeah. Or yeah, what you can do also in that same um, data, what is it, files, there's like a little three dots. If you click on it, it'll give you the path. Um, it'll copy the path of that exact CSV file. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. This one and then copy path. Okay, I'll see if that works. Okay, it's working. Thanks. Arjun, yeah, question. Um, so if I were to import like an image data set that shows like different images and maybe like a true or false for some quality in the image, would it also be a CSV file? Um, probably. Actually, let me try finding a sort of image data set with Boolean values. Not sure. If I find one, I'll try, I'll show you how.
So to answer your question on like image data sets, so pandas usually doesn't actually display images, but there is a way to display the image like in the preview using the image URL. Usually if you want to use image data sets, you just directly save like the whole data set itself as a file. And then instead of a CSV file, because CSV generally doesn't take images, it usually takes like floating point numbers. So you would just for like, if you wanted to use like, let's say logistic regression to classify images or something, you would have the image file and then the whole folder as like training data, testing data, whatever. And then you would directly train your model using those images. Does that make sense? So would you still use pandas to read it? Not necessarily. Here, I can send you this. This is just like, telling you how to display the image stored in pandas, but you wouldn't always use pandas for image data, mostly for like numerical data. Yeah. So I would like directly work with the data set instead of showing it every time I do a step. So yeah, so when you directly, you can, there's ways that you can show the image while directly working with it as well. Like there are commands like for images, you can show it in the notebook and then you can view like the specific class of data. Yeah, there's a bunch of stuff like that. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so since we still have some time, um, I'm gonna send everyone this data set. So for this data set, it's a CSV file. You can download it to your computer and then import it into Google Colab. So you guys can play around with this. Um, uh, let's do this. Okay, so there's a couple columns in the CSV file. So I want you guys to take the humidity column and find the average of all of the rows in the humidity column, and then send me that value in the chat once you've done that. And then we can talk about it. Okay, so the problem is you're going to take the CSV file, you're going to use pandas to take the humidity column, and you're going to find the average of that column. I also put in the chat if anyone needs it for reference.
Yeah, okay, so one person got it. Let's see if more people get the answer and then we can show, we can share our screen again and go over it. Two people so far. Okay, so Arhan or Arjun, um, can either one of you put your um, command into the chat so that everybody can see? I can show it on my screen as well. Yeah, sure, that works. All right. Okay, can you see it? Mm -hmm. All right, so I just downloaded it, put it in this Google Collab here, and what I'll do, first I'll read it, so copy path, then df equals pd.read csv, and then I just read it. And then if you look at the data, let's look at the first five rows. So yeah, let me just see if it matches. Yeah, it's the same data. So your task was to get the humidity column and then take the average, right? So I, would say humidity and then for the average I kind of forgot the command so I would google now but I'll google it and I'll get back to you yeah if anybody else can you just add it up and then divide by 5,000 that is one method. Yeah, you could do that. But there's a specific um, method that you could use that Pandas already has for you. I found the method. Dot me. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, and that's your answer. So that just goes to show that even if you forget things, Google is your savior. Okay, so, last um, problem before we end today. Okay, um, so find the top 10 most frequent values that appear in the inflow column. So top 10 most frequent values in the inflow column. And this one, I don't think you need to Google search. I think we went over this, hopefully.
And then once you're done, just put it into the chat. The top 10 most inflow. Okay, wait, I'll write it out. <laughs> All right, so let's see how to do this one. So what you first do, you need to grab the inflow column. So you can use in, well, hopefully it's the right, there's an underscore. So yeah, inflow and then to get the frequency of each values of data, you would get the values. Remember, we went over this to get the frequency of data. So if we just do this, we will get all the data, all the frequency of all of the rows in the inflow column. But what we want to do is get the top 10. So what do we do to get the first 10 rows of anything? We do the head code, right? So you do head, but with, if you don't pass in anything, it'll give you the first five. So we have to pass in the 10 value in order to get the first 10 rows. And as you can see, 1.04 and 0.9 are the most frequent values in this column. So obvious, yes, you are correct. Um, so yeah, that's uh, this uh, command to get the data. All right, so that is the end of today's lesson. Um, okay, let me share my screen really fast. So there's no homework. Um, and also remember to check out the document, which I can put in the chat again, for any resources, announce, announcements, anything. And yeah, thank you guys for coming. See you next week.
Hello. Um, so I, I can start um, the next class. So uh, let me, wait, could you stop sharing your students so I can put on my screen? Thank you. Um, yeah, so hi guys, um, I'm Rohan. If you guys don't remember me from last time, but let me start sharing my presentation and we can get started. Okay, um, yeah, I'll wait for everyone to join in real quick and we'll just get started in one minute. Okay, um, I guess we can just get started and because we have a lot to go through today. So um, if you guys remember from last time, what we discussed was the basic components of Flutter. So we discussed about widgets and we discussed about the app components and the app library. And we also discussed a little about what is Flutter exactly, right? So just to recap, Flutter is a, is a development framework and you code in a language called Dart. So um, using this framework, we can use this one code from Dart and utilize the framework of Flutter and put it out into six different languages. And these six different languages, you can you can uh, release your work to six different places. So um, this is one beauty of Flutter um, compared to other languages, which can only release to one place usually, which is what it's limited as. As we can see, Flutter has many tools and one of them is state management. So state management is extremely important in Flutter. And I'll discuss a little bit about what this means because state management is a very complicated word and it just doesn't make any sense right now. But once you see in the context of what we're, what's gonna happen, you'll, it'll all come together. So let's start. Um, so first we're gonna I'll go over the table content. So today we'll be discussing what are states exactly and um, what are stateful versus stateless widgets? And finally, we'll be discussing state methods and how to really modify them. And finally, we can have our hands on time and work with some real starter code and try to create our stateful app. Okay, so what are states? States are can be seen as the life or change in a widget. So as we discussed last time, a widget is an object. If you guys have done other object-oriented programming like Java or Python, we see that these objects are things that will need constantly be need updating because maybe there's a change in a variable or there can be changes in the actual color or just anything in general. Maybe an animation or some data must have loaded. So these are ways state, states come in. When we want to change a widget, we need to utilize its state property and change this inert um value that's being held towards the widget. So each widget has its own state and can update itself based on a change in variables. But to change the state, we need to control it through something called the stateful widget, which is I'll talk about a little bit later. So why are states different from other languages? So states are very different from other languages such as Java or even JavaScript, because instead of, in, instead of uh, refreshing the entire screen like they do in, the in many programs, uh, such as Java, which refreshes the screen multiple times a second, Flutter utilizes many things that'll make it so it only updates itself when it really needs to. And it updates only the very, and updates the widgets that need to be updated. For example, if we have a text widget, um, do we really need to update constant text, such as my name? My name is not gonna change every five seconds, but if we have data, like maybe somebody's pictures being taken, that data is constantly being updated. That's why that maybe widget of the picture loading will constantly be in need updating. Um, and yeah, so understanding how these different widget states changes are really important in improving how your app performs. So many people ask me, why don't we make every single widget stateless, stateful, which means that it's constantly updating. Well, in that case, do you really want a text widget to be updating on all the time? Not really. It just brings added performance and just added drag to your app. And it's just something we don't really need. So this is why we'll be discussing states, which is a very important part of Flutter. So I've been talking a lot about the stateless and stateful widget. It kind of doesn't make any sense, right? But let me go a little bit more in depth. So what are stateless versus stateful widgets? So there are two types of widgets in Flutter. There are stateless widgets, which as you can see by the name, it doesn't have a state. 
it's going to be a constant widget, like a text widget that we talked about earlier. And there's a state full widget, which it's full of a state. Um, and these widgets are widgets that will constantly updating, like maybe loading data or even an animation. So as you can see over here, I described exactly that. So a text widget, it's a part of an app that we don't really need to change and we can keep constant for the majority of the part. But a stateful widget, on the other hand, are widgets that we need to keep changing. And as data loads and as variables change, we need to make it engaging and interesting for the users, which is why we also use things stateful widgets for animation. Um, do you guys want to enter in chat maybe a few other widgets that we used maybe last time that are stateful versus stateless widgets? You guys can enter anything like even if even if we've already mentioned it don't worry just don't be shy just go ahead and you guys can enter some um you can also look at your code from last time actually here let me put the code in chat um from last time for those who didn't get the who, who for those who didn't get the solution um let me put the solution code in chat so okay so i just put the solution to week one and this opens up a our class solution. So when we run this, let's take a look at different widgets and different components that are going on within this app. So if we take a look at this, what is one widget that is going on? So we can see that over here, we have a hello world and this hello world has a counter. And in this case, we have a variable that's being updated. So this counter is being updated every time we press the increment button. So every time we press this, it's being updated. But another, but what's an example of maybe a stateless widget in this situation? Does somebody want to type that in chat? Don't be shy, guys. You guys are all friendly. The hello world label, perfect. Exactly. The hello world label is not changing, but the counter is. So we can see how this widget changes into two different things. It converts into a stateful widget and a stateless part. Perfect. What's another part maybe? There's some more text on the screen. What's something else that's not changing at all? Reset, yeah, that's another good one. Reset's not changing at all. As we can see over here, the reset button, it just, it makes a small animation but in reality, the actual widget itself behind it, the text widget is not changing. So if we scroll over here, we can see that we have an elevated button and we say a text of, of, a text of reset, but this reset text itself is not changing. Although the button might change, the button will be updated, but the content within it will not be updated. That makes it very powerful when we're making apps because we don't really want to update the reset button, do we? it's going to be the same no matter if we click it a billion times or if we click it zero times. So that's one of the beautiful parts of Flutter. It really highlights how we can use these different states and really utilize our, and you really utilize states to make our app very fluid and very performance and very high performance. Okay, we can go on to the next part. So yeah, like I was discussing a little bit earlier, Someone asked me one time, why don't we make everything stateful? Um, so a stateful widget is, it's very common for beginners to make everything stateful, but it becomes a mayor, it leads to frame, frame drops and performance drops in your actual app. And this is partly because we're updating, updating multiple things and the app needs to constantly check these other tabs. If think about it like this, if you have a hundred tabs open on your computer on Google Chrome, then wouldn't, you, wouldn't Google Chrome need to keep refreshing those tabs? But if nothing changes on those tabs, then Google Chrome won't need to refresh them. That's why when something changes, we only wanna refresh the tabs that really change rather than updating everything at once. So I hope that makes it a little bit simpler and we can take a better look at this. So like I showed you last time, we have a, in this widget, in our last code, we had a stateful widget. So there are two types of widgets. So I call this my widget and I declared it as a stateful widget. So right over here, we can see how this counter needs to be updated like we were showing in this, in this demo app. This counter needs to be updated, which is why we wanna have a stateful widget. 
But over here, we just have a simple hello world text and some theming and some styling. So that's really why we have a state list widget. And I hope I'm driving this home. I keep saying this, but it's really, really important to keep in mind your states throughout your app. You don't want to overflow with stateful widgets because it makes it unnecessary. Okay, let's go on to the next portion of this, which is the state methods. So state methods. Um, Flutter has many built-in state and what? So the widget, this the state of widgets um, needs to be, oh wait, actually before I go on to here, are there any questions? Cause I know I went a little bit fast and um, do you need me to repeat anything or do you guys have any questions? Feel free to raise your hand or if you have um, just shout out or put in chat anything that you'd like to question about. Okay, then I guess we can just move on. All right, um, so state methods. So you might be wondering, how do we update these states? Do we just update a variable? Do we increment a variable? Or do we really just, um, does it do it itself? And the answer is no. So the mo there's a method called set state in Flutter. This method checks if the widget has been updated via variable or if there's a natural state update into the theming or any other parts of this component. So we can utilize set state to update variables and to really demonstrate the state method. Okay, so what do I mean by all of this? Set state. When we come back here to our last program, we can see that we use the, utilize this button within, within this button, we utilize a method called set state. So when we press the reset button, so this is the reset button. When we press the reset button, so on pressed, we call a method. So this is a method and we call this method. And within the method, we're calling set state, which is the state method for, for the components tied to counter. So Flutter automatically knows what to update. In this case, we have this bar over here, which is a container. And this container we are going to update because it utilizes this counter. So if we highlight this, we can see where counter is being utilized. So we have a text widget up here and a count container down here. And when we press this, it sets the counter to zero. This means that we will bring the counter back to zero and the container and the text up here will be updated. But nothing else in the app really changed. And that's why nothing else was updated. As you can see, that was very quick. Even though it's something very simple, it's something to keep in mind because when we become into more performance heavy apps, we definitely wanna keep um, set state in mind and continue to utilize um, good state policies. So um, what is another example? Let's scroll down here. So here's our floating action button. This is a special type of button, which as you can see, it floats over here. And this is a special app. Um, this is a special button you might see in many apps like Gmail or anything or many other apps, but this, as we can see, sorry, when it's pressed, we can see that it sets the state, it calls a set state function and it increments counter. And counter is utilized in these components up here. And we can see that these, that it is being reflected and it's being updated correctly because it Flutter automatically knows it's, it's automatically linked to the text widget now and also automatically linked to this container. So, those are two examples of how that state works. And I hope that makes it a bit clearer. Are there any questions or comments or anything? Okay, perfect. Then I think we can move on. Um, let me check one thing and I will move on. Yeah, um, then I think that's that's all the slides I have for today. So today is going to be a very coding heavy intensive day. So I want you guys to get your fingers ready and I want you guys to get started. And so we're going to have a hands-on coding session. And what we're going to be building today, I'm very excited to show you, is going to be this. So we are going to be building a random icon generator. So when we press on this random icon, 
it loads a random icon. It, it comes up from this list and it utilizes states to update the random icon every X amount of times. So we can see that this is something that's going to keep updating and we want this to be stateful. But do we want the random icon to be stateful? That's a different situation. So we'll talk about all of this, but this is what the end products is going to be, hopefully, if everything goes well. And I'm going to put the starter code in chat right now. And let me end this presentation and I can put the starter code in chat. Okay, before I do that, um, does Emily have any questions, comments, concerns, anything? So I just put the starter code in chat um, uh, and there's also a link to the Google Classroom again, just in case you guys haven't joined it yet or there's any difficulties. Um, yeah. Okay then let's get started. So if I open the starter code, we can see that there are a lot of errors. You can see automatically there's a lot of errors, but this is on purpose. So we can create our own, so we can really go through the design process of building our first app. So what, we, what do we first need? Let's first take a look up here. And oh, first we can take a look right here. So. It says that over here, we need to set our icon. So how do we set an icon? So this is what we call an icon widget. But within an icon widget, much like a text widget, you require text, right? But in this case, we don't want to put a text, but we want to put an icon data. So to put icon data, you need to utilize icons dot, you need to utilize the icons package. So this icons, you just press icons and then we press dot and then for right now, we can put a basic icon like add. So now this will update and this, and this, I don't know why it's showing an error. Once if we format it, maybe, oh, whatever, it's okay. Don't worry, it'll work. Um, so if we put icons.add, then we will now have an icon over here. We can't run this quite yet because we haven't put all of these other, we haven't figured out all these other errors. So next, it says, it's telling us to, um, so this icon is going to be currently, would anyone like tell me if this icon is stateless or stateful? Currently is icon stateful or stateless? Put in the chat or yell it out. Stateful, are you sure? Are we gonna be updating this icon? No, so we, so we, aren't, we aren't updating the icon yet, right? Because the icon has not been updated and it's just a current constant icon. So this is a stateless widget. Perfect. Next, we're gonna come over here and we're gonna have a gesture detector. So this is another type of button. And we're gonna have an on tap function. And we're going to initially set, we're gonna set an initial set state function. So this is very exciting. We're gonna be using set state for the first time with you guys. So I want you guys to follow me and I want you guys to type in set state just like that and then put two brackets and just like that you have your set state function. So now once we um, once we type this in, we can we want to initially set the state of our um, of our gesture detector. So to do this, we really want to see two things. So when is it is the icon going is are we rolling for an icon right now or are we or do we already have an icon? So but to do this we want to also have variables to keep track of everything, right? So we're going to come back up here and we're going to make a variable. So it says implement state changing variables. So these are not constant variables. So unlike many unlike python where you'd say const or any other or uh, or even in Flutter, if you want a constant variable, you'd say const and then a variable name. But in this case, we want a constantly changing variable. So we just take out that entire const part and we can say boolean underscore is rolling equals, and then we can say false. 
just like that. So now, why do we say underscore? Um, uh, that's a good question. So why is there an underscore in the front? So underscore is in Flutter. If you put underscore in front of any method, widget, if you put in front of anything else, that means that only this class, this my widget class, that's the only class that can access that. So it, it bars the other classes. It doesn't let the other classes outside of this. So even if I made a, even, even, if, even if I said my widget, I would not be able to access dot is dot underscore is rolling. Cause it doesn't, it doesn't register as something that's available because there's, see, look, it says there's no getter for it because it's a variable that's limited to this class. So that's why we use an underscore. So that's a really good question. Um, yeah, so now that we have the is rolling Boolean, we can change this and we can say, um, we can come over here at the set state function we made earlier. And we want to, whenever, whenever we press the button, we want to set the rolling state to the opposite of the other, of the other rolling state, right? So if it's already rolling, then we want it to stop rolling. And if and if it's if it's rolling right now, then we want it to um, if it's rolling right now, then we want it to stop rolling when we push it again. And if it's not rolling, then we want it to roll, right? So this exclamation mark, as you guys might know from other languages, is the opposite of of whatever of the boolean that we are putting over here. And yeah. Sorry. Okay. Um, next, we can come over here and we can see that there's another error that's occurring. So we have the selected icon. And what does selected icon might mean? This might, this is most likely going to be the icon that we've selected. So if we come up here, we can define another variable. And in this case, we want to define an icon data variable. So icon data is what I said over here. It's much like a text widget. If we include text, we also have to include a string, right? We have to pass through a string. So much like this in icon, we have to pass through icon data. So if we come up here, we can say icon data and we can give it a name of underscore selected icon. So we can come up here and we can say underscore selected icon. And just like that, we can give it an initial icon of maybe icons.add. It doesn't matter. You can give icons at minus, subtract, something else along those lines, anything that works. Um, and once again, you can find these icons on the on the on the whole list on the Blur website. So now that we've selected the next icon, so this should go away. Don't worry about it. So the value, okay, perfect. Okay. Then next we can go to the next error. So we can come over here to line 137. Let's see. So it's saying implement text and styling. So what is this text that we want? So does anybody remember what text we want? What are we trying to make at the end of the app? What text would we want over here? What do we want? Does anybody remember? It starts with it starts with an R. A button, close, but what text do we want inside of that button? Random text. Yeah, random icon. Good job. Good job. Yeah. So we're making a random icon generator. So we can come over here and we can put a we can pass through a string and we can say random icon. And what I want you guys to do is from the last class, if you guys remember how to style a widget, how to style a text widget, I want you guys to take five minutes and I want you guys to style this text widget as much as you guys want, okay? Um, and I really want, you, uh, one sec. Oh, it looks like there's, we're missing one parentheses over here. So if you just before, sorry, I think I deleted the parentheses by accident. But if you guys want, if you guys can put one extra parentheses over here, just like this, let me format it. So it's a little bit nicer. One second. Okay. So if, if, if you guys could just put what, if you guys could put this just to start with, and then I want you guys to style this text widget. I don't know if you guys remember how to style it. And then the program should be able to run just for now. We'll see how it works. And then after that, we'll go ahead and 
we'll see what happens. So I want you guys to take the next five minutes to run this program, play around with it, style this text widget, style it completely as you want, and then we'll see how it goes, okay? All right, take the next five minutes and we'll meet back at 3.30. If you guys don't remember, just private DM me, private message me, and I'll, I'll tell you how to do it and we can work through it together. Or you guys can also look at the solution from last week and copy some things, you know? So there's a lot of ways to do it. Also, one more thing, if any of you guys have the error lines, like see how all my error lines went away, all those red lines that we had in the beginning. Um, if you guys press format right here, um, it, right now I just formatted it, but it'll format your text for you, uh, your code for you, and we can, and it'll take care of all the error lines, okay? Um, so hopefully that'll help a little bit. And if it says, and if, it, and if you run it and it still doesn't work, then we can try to figure something out. Okay, no worries. So it seems like a few of you guys um, are having some errors and some change and um, and some problems like didn't uh, you guys didn't end, come like last class. So don't worry about it. Um, we can go over styling right now. Um, really quickly, I just want uh, to clear up one error. Uh, Ian, could you share your screen really quick and then we can just check your code and we can work from there. And then, and then I can discuss the styling right after that. Oh, it's disabled. Sorry. Okay, let me. Okay, try one more time. Okay, okay. Um, so on line 76, it's saying, so on line 76, uh, so you need to put a, uh, you, you need to put a semicolon right there, yep. Yep, perfect. And then next on line 99, Line 99. Yep, just another semicolon at the end. Don't worry. And then right at the end, okay, so right at the end, just um, on line 140. Oh, what happened? Uh, sorry, did you do something or? Okay, yeah, right at, right at line 140. Um, do you mind if you click on the, on, yeah, just go one character back. Okay, and then can you go one character down and then one left? Okay, so, and then could you go to the one, line 143 and click on that bracket really quick? Okay, 
Um, let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Okay, uh, I think you're just missing one parentheses right before the bracket. So just put um, a parentheses, yeah, right there and put a comma, put a comma right after it. And yeah, I think that's about it. So now you can press format at the top. Yeah. Okay, there we go. I think all your errors should be gone. Okay, perfect. Okay, next. Okay, uh, you have errors in your code. Okay, there's a couple of errors. No worries, no worries. We'll go over it. This is why I left lots of time. Okay, so first I really want to discuss styling. Um, no worries. Okay. Um, yeah, I want to discuss styling really quickly before we go on to um, some of the errors so people can play around with styling. So um, text styling. So once we go in this text widget, um, we can come over here and we can hit enter right after this comma and then we get a property called style. So this is a parameter that we can pass into any widget. And just like over here, we have a box decoration. So this is a decoration for the box. And we can see that it has the color of blue. So much like this, we want to pass in a text style. And over here, we, this is a this is another property called text style. And then within text style, we can give many properties such, we, there are many properties. So what I want you to do is I'm going to put a link in chat so we can search up Flutter text style widget. And then when, once when we go over here, we have this entire class. We have this entire documentation. And this tells you all the things that you can edit in text style. So you can edit the height, you can edit the configuration. But really what I want you to work on, don't worry about any of this fancy stuff, but I want you, what I want you to work on is coming over here to this property section. And you can see that you can play around with the color, the decoration, the font family, the font size, the font style. So there's a lot of things you guys can play around with. And I want you, and I'll put this link in chat really quickly and you guys can check it out. Um, and I'll leave up the code for a little bit so you guys can check it out as well. Okay. Yeah, so just like this, and then here's an example. So if I say font size, we can make the font size maybe 100. Oh, that's too big, maybe, maybe 40. And then we run it. And then we can see that it's taken this shape over here, okay? So just like that. So see, look, when I click on it, it starts the rolling. And then when I click off of it, it comes off of it. So just like that. Um, yeah, and then when I, when I run the code, nothing happens. Um, okay, I'll come back to you. Um, Rian, uh, sorry, I'm, I might be pronouncing your name wrong. Oh, yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, so to, um, to everyone who didn't understand and the, from the first class the styling, does that make sense? Is your code working? Just give me a thumbs up or put in chat, it's all working. Thumbs up, okay, perfect. Okay, okay, beautiful, okay. Next, um, who's next? Okay, uh, Rian, would you like to share your screen? I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. Oh, sorry, uh, Rian, Rian, not Ian, sorry. Okay, yeah, sorry, <laughs> yeah, there we go. Okay, um, let's take a look here. So it says that the argument map dynamic is a forward function. Um, so up here at the set on line 95, um, yep. I think you're missing a bracket. Yep. So put one more bracket and oh, the, uh, the, the, the curly bracket, curly bracket, the end curly bracket. Yeah. Okay. And then, uh, just, just the end one, just the end one. Uh, okay. Here, uh, I can put it in chat really quickly and then you maybe copy and paste it if that works. Okay, there we go. I just put it in, oh, sorry, wrong person. Um, okay, I just put it in chat. You can copy that and hopefully that'll work. And then let's take a look at the other um, errors. So if we come down here to center um, text, so right under that, you're actually missing one parentheses. So come back to line 142. Yep, and then just put one more print. Uh, next uh, after the after the comma 
Yeah, put a parenthesis and then put a comma. Uh, just, just the end parentheses. Yep, and then put a comma. Perfect. Okay, and then now I think it should work. These are just these are just some uh, linter errors, so don't worry about that. You press format at the top, and then um, on the top left, right there, you press format, and you can press run. Yep, run, and you press format up there as well. Right at the top on. Yep, there we go. Beautiful. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Okay, um, next, um, Janine, would you like to share your screen? Okay, perfect. So I think it's uh, a similar thing. So can you scroll up to line 96? Yeah, and so instead of a colon, we need a semicolon. Yep, perfect. And then if we scroll, um, so it says, so it, oh, on line 101, we actually don't want, we don't worry about, don't uh, just delete the exclamation underscore selected icon. Oh uh, yeah, just uh, delete the selected icon part as well. Yeah, right there. Yep, that part. Perfect. Yep, don't worry about that. And then we can scroll down to line 143 and do the same thing. Put a comma, I uh, put a parentheses and then a comma right there. So line 143, right before, uh, right before the, uh, right before the bracket. Yeah, there we go. And then put a parentheses and then a comma. Yep. And then we can press format at the top. You're going to press format really quickly. It'll just, it'll make everything look nice at the top, at the top left format, format. Yeah. Okay. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Just that format button right there. Okay. That works as well. So don't worry. Don't worry. Okay. Um, next, uh, great job guys. Great job. It's, it's looking really good. Um, for some reason, nothing happens in the code runs. Uh, did you fix your error Ian, or do you still have an error? Okay, um, if you still have an error, um, let me know. Otherwise we can move on. You can share your screen if you have an error. How about that? Okay, then I'll take it as you don't have an error. So don't worry. Okay, so now we can come back over here and we can continue on. Oh, sorry, I, I have a question. Why doesn't anything happen when I run the code? Um, when you run it, it should look like this for right now. Does it, does it not look like this? Okay, um, let me explain the next part and then I'll get everyone working and then we can, uh, we can play around with some things. So how's your guys' um, stuff going on? So did you guys change the color? Do you guys change it to like colors.red? Or do you guys change it to like colors.black or something? So we can change it different colors. And as you can see, if I update this, it'll update to red and random icon, it's all red. Okay, so next, what we wanna do is we want to change this plus, right? So right now we have a pretty stateless plus. So we have an add button that's stateless. Um, but what did we define earlier that's constantly changing? So we define the selected icon. So the selected icon is a variable that'll be constantly changing. Like we did in the last one, remember when we had the counter, when we incremented the counter, so when we pressed on the counter, it changed the variable. And as a result, the widgets that were connected to that variable, like the text widget, that box and other things like that, all those things were connected to that counter. And as a result, they were also changed. So as we can see over here, the icon data is changed. And we can come over here and in, instead of a stagnant add, we want a selected icon. So we can press on selected icon. And just like that, we can press format. We can give this like that. We can press format. 
And just like that, we have a, so right now, because the selective icon in the beginning is an icons.add, it'll be the same, right? But once we implement this logic over here, so if we press random icon, oh, it generates a random icon, right? So um, yeah, that's, so now it's looking a lot better. It's looking like a random icon generator, right? But I want to come back over here and I want to implement this last part of this animation. This animation is set state function, right? So we want to have the end animation. So what do we want to do? So right now when we click on it, it's rolling, but it doesn't go back to its original state. So it doesn't go back to no button, if that makes sense. So it doesn't go back to not having this, this hue around it, this color around it, this color around the box. It doesn't go back to that, right? So um, yeah, Ian, uh, just give me one second. I'll, I'll help you right after we finish this. So I can give people time to work on the project by themselves. Uh, just give me one second. Um, so we can come back over here and we can come back and we can implement a, another type of logic. And we're gonna be implementing a logic to cancel this. So we can call this and we can say set state. And once we set the state, or actually, instead of this, so what we want to do is we want to do the same thing up here. So we want to call this, and so we can just copy this. So copy this set state up here. So is rolling underscore underscore is rolling is equal to that, and we can put it right here. Okay. And when we do this, what's happening now is that we're initially rolling, but after this period of one thousand two hundred milliseconds, we are canceling the roll, and we finally have an icon that we have selected. So that's very exciting, okay? And now we can press format and we can press run and let's take a look at what happens. I'm very excited. Okay, let's take a look. Um, and now when we press this, it, it rolls a random icon, but it doesn't look that great, does it? It looks very one, it looks very, uh, one time, like look, it looks like it's flashing, right? But how do we ease this? So we can use a property of animation. So we can come over here and where it says animate container, we can call this and we can call, change it to an animated container. So now that we've chained this animated container, it's saying that I need a parameter called duration. So in Flutter, there are required parameters, much like this widget has a required parameter. So when we follow this, we can say, and we can say it requires a parameter of duration. So we can put a duration. And then what would we need? We'd need something like this. So we need a duration of milliseconds 1200. So we can say duration. And we don't want our animation to be super long. So we can just say milliseconds, maybe 100. And, and then after that, we can put a comma. Remember to put this comma because this is like, this is syntax for Flutter to put a comma at the end and to, to give everything space. So now that we have this, we can format once again and we can press and we can come back over here and everything will be set. And now when we run this, we can press run. And yep, of course, Arhan, no worries. Um, and then, yeah, so now when we run this, what happens? We have a duration of 100 milliseconds on this animation. And as we can see, look at that. It looks like it's flowing. So we can obviously change this. You guys can style it however you want, 400 seconds, 300 seconds. And of course, I implore you guys to try to change like just random things. If it doesn't work, just Command Z or Control Z or whatever works for you. Um, but you can go back to, you can change the properties of different things. You can change the height and look of this thing. And you can even change, maybe you can change the alignment of the text. So you can say text align and then text align dot centered or something like that, or like left or right or something. So, but, and always just remember you guys can con control Z. So I, I tell, I hope you guys will try to explore a little bit more as we go into these last 15 minutes of class. Um, and now I can help. Um, I can leave this code up for a little bit and then I'll go on to helping other people um, with their code who are who have a little bit of struggling. And then Arhan, I'll come back to you. I'll show you, I'll show you the code really quick. And yeah.
Yep, Ian, uh, I'll get back to you. I'll come back in one second. I'm just showing the code for everyone who didn't get the code earlier, um, who or who were, were still coding, yeah. Yep, so that's pretty much um, what we've made so far. I hope you guys for the last 15 minutes just continue coding, continue just trying to make these, make small adjustments, maybe make the timer smaller, maybe make it so the size is smaller or just change random stuff and see how it works. Play around, it's the best way of learning. And of course, you can also visit the Flutter website and check out different kinds of widgets that you might wanna add. Maybe you'd want to add a, a reset button of some sorts that resets it back to the original icons that add, or you'd want to reset it back to a different icon. You can change all these things up. And here I can actually drop a list of all the icons. So if we just search up just simple things like that, list of Flutter icons, I can give you right here. Here's a list of all of the Flutter icons. And this will show you the list of, oh, sorry, my internet is slow, but this will show you all the icons that are, exist in Flutter. There's thousands and thousands of them. You guys can go through them and we can pick some out. And yeah, so next uh, we can go on to sharing. Ian, I think you had some problems. So Ian, would you like to share your screen? Okay, so you were saying that it's, it's not it's not changing. Yeah, so we haven't um yeah we haven't uh implemented. So remember we have to change up at the top. Uh, we have to change the icon. So remember it became it was a stateless icon, right? At the right at the top on line eighty eight, we just have icon .add. So when we actually update the icon variable, we aren't changing anything, right? So what we want to update this update this to is the selected icon. So under so we want to delete that. And we want to change it to underscore selected icon. And then we want to put a comma, right? Uh, yeah, right after that. Yep, there we go. Perfect. And then now let's press run. Yep, it takes some time. It takes some time. It's just it's just a website, so don't worry. Yep, there we go. Beautiful. Looks really nice. Okay, I hope you guys are enjoying, um, and you guys can hopefully. Uh, yeah, no worries, Ian. No, that's no worries. If anybody else has any questions, just raise your hand, and I can put up I can put up the code again. If any of you guys were um, a little bit behind, so don't worry. Um, let me know what part to scroll down to. If you guys have any errors or any problems, raise your hand, shout out, text anything. Anything works. Yeah, but your guys' projects are looking really great. I think you guys did a great job today. Um, and we got through a lot too. We coded this entire thing in what, 15, 20 minutes. So it was great. Good job, guys. Okay. And then, um, so lastly, I would like to, I would like you guys to try different things. So maybe change the colors over here. So I maybe want to change this color to green. Who knows? Then say colors.green. We can change this and let's see what happens if we change it to green. Oh, look at that. That's a different kind of hue now all together. So we definitely did a great job today, guys. Um, if you guys have any questions or any comments or anything like that about the code, the class, anything about even states or anything like that, um, anything else? Okay, how about this? Um, for the last 10 minutes of class, we ended a little bit early. How about we go through all the widgets that we've made and let's go through and see what is stateful and what is stateless as a quiz for you guys, as like an end quiz. I want you guys to all put in chat, put in private chat to me so you guys don't um, expose the answer, okay? So let's start off. Let's start with the first widget. So this is a column widget. So what does this column hold? 
This column is holding all of these widgets in here. All of these widgets that you've just programmed, we've, we're putting all these column widgets in here. So what do you think that this is a stateful or a stateless widget? This is a trick one. This is really hard. Let's see, put it in private chat, put it in private chat. Ooh, I'm getting mixed responses. Stateless, stateful, stateless, stateful. What do you guys think? Okay, it looks like most people are saying stateful. Ooh, okay, this is actually a stateless widget. Good job. Okay, whoever got it right, good job. Um, so basically, why is it stateless? Because in even though it's holding all these other widgets that are changing, the column widget itself is not changing. So this means that nothing in everything, the widgets are separate from the column, even though the column is holding them, um, the column itself is not changing. So another example of this was in our last class, even though the reset button was not changing, the button or the reset text in the button was not changing, the text, the button itself was changing, right? But the reset text was not. So that's an example of a stateless versus stateful widget. Okay. I hope that makes a little bit more sense, but that's, that was a hard one. That was a hard one. Sorry. That was hard, bad start off on that. Okay. Let's take a look at what about this container? Is this container going to be a stateful or a stateless widget? Yeah. Good job guys. Stateful, stateful. Uh, everyone said stateful. So good job. Yeah. Cause we are animating this container after all the shadows, the animation, everything is changing from time to time. So this is really good. Um, let's see, what about this text over here? Is this gonna be stateful or stateless? Okay, okay. Some more responses. Let's type in the chat, type in the chat. Yeah, good job, guys. It's stateless. That's really nice. Yeah, because the actual text of the random icon is not changing. So it doesn't have a state. And automatically Flutter determines that this is going to be a stateless widget. So there's no point in adding the set state function to this. Um, OK, uh, I think we have eight minutes left. If you guys have any questions or comments, I think that's all I have for the quiz. Um, it was a very short quiz. It was very impromptu. Um, but. If you guys have any questions or comments or any concerns, I guess. <laughs> but if you guys have anything, um, you guys can let me know. Otherwise, we can end class in a little bit early. OK, um, then I think that's about it. So I. Um, I would highly recommend you guys, I'll post all the slides and all the solutions and everything to the Google Classroom. So I can drop the link for that one more time if you guys um, don't have the link for that yet. But um, I can, uh, yeah. So if you guys have any more questions, feel free to type them in the chat. Otherwise you guys are free to go. Um, you guys can, um, yeah, you guys, you guys can post some questions or comments or anything that you guys have in the Google Classroom or in the chat too. Um, and I'll try to get back to you on those. And um, so as for homework, there's no homework, but I'll give you guys like a practice problem set if you guys want. Um, I, I'll give you guys like a practice uh, thing that you guys can make. And um, I hope you guys can have fun with that and hopefully get through that as well. Um, and yeah, uh, that's about it. So I hope you guys have a great rest of your day and I'll see you guys next Sunday. Bye.
Hi, Anu and Diksha. Hi. <laughs> I'm starting my video. I don't know why the video is not showing. All right, it's still continuing the recording. Okay. All right, so okay, so we'll just wait till four. Yes. Okay.
Hi, can we get started with uh, the boot camp? Yeah, okay, so, uh, okay, so let's start. Okay, so, um, hi, um, so this is going to be the second week of the LEGO Robotics Bootcamp, and today we're just going to be covering the basics of robot strategy and design. Um, we'll, this is going to be just a small portion of that, but we'll be going, uh, we'll be doing like another part of that at our next session next week. So, so first, let me ask uh, Rishan, uh, were you there last week? You're on mute, uh, Rishan. Okay, just get started with the session. Okay. So this is the design process overview for your building your robot. So the first thing you want to do is develop a strategy and pop out the missions that you're planning on doing. Um, second thing is determine what your robot needs and figure out those requirements. The third thing is gain a solid understanding of the system processes. And then your last step is to design the robot. So some things to consider when you're pathing. Your Hi, I'm not sure about the others, others but we, we can't, can't hear anything. anything. Uh, uh, can, you, can you hear me? something is hello can you hear us hello can anyone hear us Uh, Vidushi, can you hear? Yeah, I can. Okay, great. Um, so I think, Rishan, you might have to log out and log in again because uh, Vidushi can hear us. Um, maybe try typing it. Okay. Maybe, you know. Uh, should I start from the beginning after? Yeah, Vidushi, just give us a minute. Uh, let's have uh, Rishan join back in. Okay. Were you here last week, Vidushi? Yeah. Oh, you were great. Well, and do you have any questions for uh, the mentors? No. Uh, okay. Can I ask two questions? Sure. Are you uh, going to meet in person also at some point in time? To it depends on the interest. We definitely, uh, you know, uh, both the mentors would love to actually host an in-person uh, session. We just wanted to make sure that there is enough interest from different kids. Um, so we could uh, definitely have, uh, you know, a session next week in person if that is of an interest. Yeah, because at least with Ushi, he might be online. Okay, okay. Point noted, um, I'll definitely have um, this communicated to um, the organizers and then uh, we will actually communicate back to you if it is, uh, you know, like, I think it is possible next week. Okay, and will it be the same time? Or will it be It'll be the same time. It'll be the same time. Yeah, because we will start having conference Right. And, and um, uh, mentors, um, Rishan had missed the first session. Do you want to 
actually very briefly talk about what you covered in the first session and uh, about the teams and then you can move forward. Uh, yeah, could you uh, put yourself on mute really quickly? Oh yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so um, for those of you who weren't here last week, um, we kind of just gave our, um, our session was, was covering uh, the basics of FLL and the basics of how competitions will work and how to register teams and um, how to look for teams. So for, um, okay, cool. So for the teams being formed, um, we're having you guys do that on your own. So, um, so you can reach out to any friends you might have that, are, that you know are interested in um, participating in FLL and you can check with people at, our, at your school, school district, or even in your city. Um, but yeah, so it's just like a matter of like reaching out to people that you think may be interested. Um, so and then, yeah, and then you would register. Is it for summers or is it going to be longer than that? Like, is it going to be a session through school year also, or just through summer? Um, it'll just be through summer. So our, we're going to be doing it weekly until the last day of July. And then we'll, we're going to have, um, if, if needed, we'll do a few sessions, maybe in August, but, um, our main sessions are going to be only weekly during July. Okay. Yeah. Because a lot of people are traveling and that's the reason I yeah. low, low, uh, uh, that, I mean, we were trying to reach out to a few people, but I think they're all traveling. Yeah. So we're hoping people will be able to see, um, the recorded videos, um, that are posted. Mm -hmm. um, oh, okay. So you can always try reaching out, uh, Rishan, you can always try reaching out to anyone you see on the call that you think might not have a team. Um, but none of our sessions are going to be covering um, making or like none of none of the sessions are going to be devoted to you finding a team, I guess, with other people. Okay, so the best way um, I think Rishan and Vidushi that you can form a team is if you actually can, uh, you know, whatever you learn in these sessions from the mentors, uh, you, you, you know, you can actually take that information and reach out to some of the other kids who are within your school or within your school district or even, you know, uh, you know, kids or family friends who would like to form a team. Uh, in the past, that is what the mentors have done. Uh, they were one of the participants of the FLL bootcamp uh, a few years ago when they were in middle school. And that is how they actually reached out to other kids uh, within their school and they formed a team and then started participating in competitions. So our advice would be that, you know, you don't necessarily have to be restricted to anyone on this call or within your school, within your school district or anywhere within your region, you can find uh, people that you can actually meet on a regular basis as you prepare for the competition. And for FLL, uh, it's like a combination of elementary and middle or just elementary? Um, it's going to, it's a combination of um, older elementary school, or yeah, older elementary schoolers, so fourth and fifth graders, and you can do it um, up to eighth grade. So it, it can be a combination, yeah. Um, what about, oh, so um, usually I think um, we can, uh, is, I don't know if most of this was in the last video, but um, coaches would, um, you can find them either um, through any of your team members' parents, so they can be coaches. You can also find if there are any um, former FLL participants that are in high school, they can also serve as a coach. Um, older siblings that participated also. Um, any of these uh, people can be sources for a coach. Uh, are there any other questions we can answer before starting? Okay. Okay, so should, should we just start then? Um, so, so this week we're going, or today we're going to be covering, um, the basics of robot strategy and design. Um, 
And this is going to kind of pull over to next week's session. Um, this is just going to be kind of part one of this topic. Um, and we'll cover another part of that uh, at our next session next week. All right, so this is the design process overview. Um, and there are four steps. The first one is you develop the strategy and then find out how you want to tap all of the missions. Um, the second one is determining what your robot needs and the requirements. And the third step is to gain um, an understanding of all the system processes. And then the last step is you can finally start designing your robot. So some things to consider um, when you're pathing your missions and building your robot um, is your robot will drift um, if it's traveling for an extended amount of time. So if it's the longer your robot is traveling on the mat, um, the more it will drift off or like veer off of its path that you've set it to if it's going in a straight line, for example. Um, another thing you want to account for is traveling time. Um, this will, because you're going to missions that are farther away from your robot base, um, it will take up a lot of time to go back and forth if you're doing multiple missions in one area um, that are all far away from your robot base. So that's why the third reason, the third thing you want to consider is the location of missions and that plays in with combining missions. If you have multiple missions that are far away from your robot base and they're all relatively in the same area, you can um, combine missions. And we'll go over that in a slide um, in other slides. All right, so a little bit more on the robot drift as I was previously. Um, the longer your robot or the farther your robot travels, the more it's going to drift. And this can happen because the wheels are not aligned properly or you set, started your robot off at too much of an angle. Um, and all these things can cause your robot to drift as it goes to the So um, some things you can, uh, some strategies you can use when pathing um, is first, um, if there are multiple missions you wanna complete that are close to the robot base, you can complete them all individually um, because there's not a lot of time you need to spend um, for travel time. So in this example, you'd be doing mission one and coming back, mission two, coming back, and mission three and coming back. And also because they're so uh, close to the robot base, you don't really have to worry about your robot veering too much off of its path. Um, but if you have multiple missions you want to complete that are all far away from your robot base, um, but they're all in relatively the same area, um, instead of spending time going back and forth to do each mission individually and spending a lot of time on traveling, um, you can spend time traveling once um, completing, for example, mission one, then going directly into mission two, and then mission three, and then coming back to the robot base. And um, this will shorten how much time you have to use to travel. So this is another strategy, which is divide and conquer. And it's the idea that you're splitting up the, uh, the mat into different zones and completing the missions that are in each zone. So this way you can save time to do more missions and also stop your robot from drifting that much. Um, and some considerations you want to, more considerations you want to keep in mind when um, pathing out your missions is uh, first making sure your robot is accurate. This has more to do with like placement and adjusting your robot um, and its path. So um, if you're testing, we recommend um, testing like a mission path, like if you're doing multiple missions in one group, um, we recommend kind of testing that out multiple times and making sure that your robot is able to complete all three missions uh, successfully um, majority of the time. So if your robot can only complete the missions successfully like two out of 10 times, that's not, very reliable. So you would want to know that and make sure that you can fix um, any problems that you can before your competition. 
Um, and then another thing you can do or you should do is complete missions that you know are more reliable and accurate first, um, instead of wasting time doing missions that are worth more points that you know are less reliable, just so that you can kind of count on a certain amount of points being earned. And um, the last thing is even though even though um, your robot will have to go at like kind of a slower pace when going to missions and mission groups, um, just so that it stays on a, a certain path uh, accurately, um, you should make sure that your robot is returning to the base as fast as possible um, because you're not really relying on any path and it doesn't need to be in a, in a certain orientation. You, all you have to do is come back to um, the robot base and just as fast as possible. So um, here are some strategies for getting points is you want to determine the missions that is possible for you to do and also um, check the assigned points for the mission paths. So see how many points you are scoring if you're combining missions to create a path um, and estimate the time it's going to take to complete each mission and also iterate and optimize the scoring points. Um, also, while you're pathing and you're kind of thinking about um, the design of your robot based on the missions you're completing, um, you should kind of think about some objectives and um, kind of answer some questions um, so that you know what your robot should have. So some examples would be like, how fast do we need to drive? Um, how many motors do we need? Uh, where should attachments be mounted and what size um, should your constraints be? Um, these will all be really helpful when, like before building your robot, just thinking about the design and what you need for each mission, these will be like really helpful to think about. Um. So this is a system overview. So starting in the middle, this is your EV3 brick, and this is kind of the base of your robot. It's kind of the, um, the brain almost, it, you can turn it off, you can turn it on, it's kind of what starts your robot. Um, and to attach to it are all the sensors and motors that you can utilize during the robot thing. Um, so here's just like a quick video um, of someone explaining how to use the EV3 brick and how to use it to upload your code. So, are you showing this? Sorry. Sorry, we're just having a little bit of a difficulty. Um, What happened? Uh... Oh, stop shit. Um, okay, so we're just going to. Um, let us know if you can do it. All right. 
This is the Lego Mindstorms EV3 programmable brick. It's the brains of the Lego robots. It can read sensors and other inputs, perform calculations, and control motors and other outputs. It takes six AA batteries or uses an EV3 rechargeable battery that can be charged using the appropriate wall charger. The battery clicks into the back of the EV3 brick like so. The EV3 brick turns on by pressing this middle button. As it starts up, we'll show some other features of the EV3 brick. Along the bottom are four input sensor ports labeled one through four. Along the top are four output motor ports labeled A through D. Using wires, you can connect sensors to the bottom of the EV3 brick. Here's a color sensor being connected to port three. Or you can connect motors to the top. Here's a motor being connected into port C. In addition to sensors and motors, it's possible to connect various other Lego pieces to the connection points along the sides of the brick for creating more complex robotic structures. Along the top is a USB port. Here's where a USB cable can be plugged in for connecting the EV3 brick to your computer. This is for programming or collecting data. There's a second USB port along the side. This port is used for daisy chaining multiple EV3 bricks together or for connecting a Wi Fi dongle. Additionally, there's an SD card expansion slot, which allows adding extra memory to the brick. Now that the EV3 brick has started up, you can shut down by using this back button and confirming. Okay, yeah. So, um, so yeah, so this is just kind of a basic video on the different parts of um, the brick and things that it can do. And um, so this is going to be it, the um, last video kind of covered plugging in motors, but this is going to be this video will kind of go a little bit more in depth about um, the different types of motors you can use and what they do. Here we'll discuss the two types of motors found within the EV3 kit. First one here on the left is a large motor, which looks something like this. And here on the right, we're comparing it against what's called the medium motor. And the first thing to notice is that the axis of rotation on these two is slightly different. Here on the large motor, if you put an axle through it, the rotation actually goes uh, parallel to the plane here. First on the medium motor, the axle goes here in the front, which means the angle of rotation is about that. Second, some more comparisons between the two. The large motor actually has more power and as a result is able to exert more torque, which is definitely a positive. However, there is more play in the motor itself. And that can, you can see by just wiggling it right here, where without even moving the motor, it moves a little bit. In comparison to that, the medium motor has less power and thus less torque. However, it also has less play, which in this case is a positive. And we can see that actually by using an axle, putting it in, and you can see that there's very little play that barely moves. When connecting motors to the EV3, there's many different ways in which to connect them along the different connection points. Here, I've actually just used two of the black connector pins and can click it right into the side. You'll notice though, however, that this is not very structurally sound. These motors wiggle a lot along that connection point. So there's a little trick you can do, just using a beam and some connector pins, 
plugging in here along the back to actually turn this into a quite sturdy structure. Now those motors don't move much at all by adding that perpendicular pin. Um, it's also a good idea to do more research um, on your own using like just kind of searching up um, more information about the different types of motors when you start building and designing your robot. Um, so um, another thing you want to uh, look at is motor control. Um, so the uh, motors used in FLL are servo motors. And um, the nice thing about servo motors um, are that they have built-in encoders and built-in position control software for FLL. Um, this video is kind of, the um, slides will be posted on um, the Google Doc, um, but the video just kind of goes into a little more um, science and like how the motors actually work. Um, we're just gonna move on, but um, you can watch this on your own if you are interested in learning about it. Welcome back to Control System Lectures. In this video- So this is localization and um, these are just some points. So robots are generally not that great at following commands like move forward a certain amount. Um, and so to correct themselves, these robots need to be able to get feedback from their environment. And this is kind of known as localization. Um, and here's like a final video. Um, the past videos also talked about connecting sensors to the EV3 brick. Um, this video will kind of give an overview of like basic sensors you might need, but we will cover it in more in depth um, next week. Talk to you about some sensors for the Lego EV3 robot. Sensors are very important. They help your robot work. There are several different types of things that sensors can do, such as detecting color, detecting motion, and they can also detect bumps. So the first sensor I'd like to talk about is the gyro sensor. The gyro sensor is a very good sensor, and it's probably one of the most important sensors for your robot. You'll want to use this to make your robot go straight and do more precise turning. You can turn an exact number of degrees, like turning 90 degrees. And also, you can make your robot go in such a straight line that you can actually make it correct itself if it goes wildly off. Even if you turn it all the way around, your robot can correct itself with a gyro sensor. Next up, we'd like to talk about the touch sensor. As you can see, the touch sensor has a button on it. This button detects, obviously, bumps or whenever you run into something. You can also place an axle under it, which could extend the button. You can assign certain actions to the button or the touch sensor. These actions could be things such as making a noise or determining if your robot should go a certain direction. This is useful for when you're trying to navigate the playing field and you know your robot's going to run into something. So you can implement that into the program to go, when it runs into this wall, I want it to turn right and then move forward 20 rotations. The next sensor we'd like to talk about is the color sensor. You can tell it's a color sensor because it has this lens in the front of it. The color sensor bounces light off of different colors and it can tell you different, if it sees different colors and it can also tell you the intensity of light. So you can make your robot follow lines in the playing field because the playing field has black lines. You can also tell it to stop at lines and you can also tell distance with it. It's pretty useful and you need to make sure you calibrate it, which I can show you in a later programming video. Next up, we'd like to bring up the infrared sensor. This is a very cool sensor because it's sitting in the fact that it has eyes and it does the same thing that eyes do. It allows you to tell the, di the distance between two objects, being one being the infrared sensor and then another object being something like a wall. The infrared sensor could also do another cool thing. It can allow you to use the remote for your EBC robot. The remote allows you to control your robot wirelessly and instead of having to program your robot. It's pretty cool. But in the FLL competition, 
you're not allowed to use it because you have to program your robot to be autonomous and run fully programmed throughout the field. So you're not allowed to use the infrared sensor. There is, however, a solution. You can use the ultrasonic sensor, which is able to do the same things as the infrared sensor, but it cannot connect to a remote. You can also use a color sensor for shorter distances. The last of the sensors are not traditional sensors because you can't really place them on the robot. They're built into the robot. So one of these sensors is the rotation sensor. It tells you how far the motor itself has spun and it's the exact amount the motor has moved. Now this isn't the distance that the robot has moved because depending on speeds and such, it can go faster and slower and farther or shorter. And another one of the sensors that's built into this is the time sensor, which means if you wanted your robot to move for five seconds in a straight line, you can do that. And your robot will be able to tell you after five seconds has passed. The time sensor is also very helpful for when you're doing the gyro sensor because it helps tell the gyro how long to run for when your robot is correcting itself while it's going straight. Thank you for watching our video. We hope that we taught you something important. Um, so yeah, so these are just kind of basic sensors that you might want to use. Um, some of the more important ones, or like most of them we'll be going over um, in a, like next week's session um, when we go more in depth about the design. Um, but some sensors you might want to like consider using, um, like they talked about, is the gyro sensor to make sure that your robot is going um, on its path correctly. And then the color sensor is also really great because um, on the FLL game mat, um, there are lines drawn on it and um, you can use your color sensor to make sure that your robot is going on a, on a certain path um, using those lines and making sure that it's getting to the path, to the mission that it needs to go to. Um, we'll also kind of talk about um, how to code up the sensors in a future uh, session, um, I think in two weeks from now. But um, yeah, so these are just the basic uh, sensors. Um, and yeah, so this is our final slide for today. Um, are there any questions uh, we can answer for you? So the question for Vidushi I have is, uh, which school do you go to? And this I'm asking uh, from, from a perspective of helping you find a team. So you're on mute, Vidushi? Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, I think yes, I viewed all uh, So this is Vidushi's mom. Oh, hi. Uh, she has conflict. I just wanted to you know, review the content. Um, uh -huh. uh, it's good. Uh, this is inf good information. But uh, you, are you going to do the same format for the next few classes? Um, I think we, unless um, the program um, like runners, unless they have, um, unless they let us know that we're going to be moving into person, in person, um, this would be the format that we're doing it for the next few sessions. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So and when you have recorded sessions, right? Sorry. You have recorded session if we miss it. Yeah. So um, all of our sessions are recorded and they should be sent out also to all of the um, mm -hmm. attendees. So how do I see, because I'm looking at your uh, archive, right? So June 27, we go, that's where you have that. Um, here, document, and in that document, archives 2021, but I don't um, see that. Here, let me, let me share this um, in the chat. Okay, so this is um, the document that we're updating. Um, the top part of the document has all of the updated information for this summer. Um, and there's a table on the, that starts on the first page um, and it's sorted into the different weeks. 
And at the bottom of each um, column, it'll there it says um, class video, and you can just watch the entire video and skip forward to whichever session you want to look at. So after today's session ends, they're going to um, add the link. Back. Uh, you see me and hear me? Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, are there any other questions you can answer? I have nothing else. Thank you so much. And I think I'll I'll try to join in and listen in uh, to see what advice can I give to my daughter. Uh, I think because this time may not work for her at least for the next few few days yeah okay right. so well, one thing is that i did reach out while the call was going on i'm actually one of the mentors mom and um i reached out to the organizers and they said that if we have very few students um you know then it would be difficult to actually do an in-person session uh, i can see it i can absolutely see it you know it's not <laughs> worth the time i understand that but yeah, and a lot, of, a lot of them are looking at the videos, right? So, uh, yeah. so both the mentors are around, uh, you know, what we have asked the organizers are is, you know, to share the email addresses of all the registered students so that uh, the mentors can actually reach out to them and answer any questions and help you guys with, you know, any kind of like even team building that you want to do, maybe connect with, you know, the people who are registered, who are uh, interested in forming teams. So uh, whatever is, is required or needed, uh, the mentors are going to be there to help out. Yeah, Smith, I think uh, the psychology of kids, my daughter, after two years of all online, right? She's- Yes, I mean, it's totally understand. They just lose interest. They just lose that uh, yes. calm. Yeah. So uh, I am joining it today. So she yes. will <laughs> just drop out next week. So if she sees them in person, it's more inspiring. And that was right. asking, you know, because yeah. it's been hard for everyone. Yeah. Not no, it is. It is very hard. And uh, if I may ask which school district does she goes to or which school does she go to? She's going to Argonaut. Oh, she's going to Argonaut. Oh, so you are just close by. Um, uh, both, both Anu and Diksha, who are the mentors, are Saratoga High students. And so, um, you know, if uh, Vidushi needs help, I'm sure Anu and Diksha can actually just meet her in person if you are in Saratoga. Yeah, uh, my son, sure. so Anu Diksha, my son is also joining her at Saratoga High. He'll be in ninth grade. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, he is also sad that he did not get to FTC and FLL. Uh, I'm just looking forward to joining the team. Um, but yeah, he has been doing FLL all these, all these years. So, you know, we have not been able to inspire Vidushi. We thought, you know, you will probably inspire her. Having that uh, opportunity to see you in person may give her that opportunity, you know. Uh, when we speak, it's a different, you know, mindset. Yeah. Right. So one more thing is that do you have a WhatsApp group or something for your uh, class? You know, like the mom's group or something? That yes, I will send it out, but I think most of the people I know are traveling. Yes, <laughs> I, I totally get it. So uh, everybody's been like hung up, like, you know, they, they all are cornered and st st you know, stuck with the no travel. Now this year is the travel, so everybody's traveling. I, I totally get it. That's why, our, you know, because last year and the year before that, the participation was really big, uh, actually online also. And when, when Anu actually started, you know, she joined the boot camp that was in person, that was before COVID happened. And the, there were so many students and they would form a team. But uh, what we can do is that if you can stay in touch with, with us, then, you know, uh, and if you can actually share this information about FLL on your WhatsApp group, if, if kids need help, Anu and Diksha can definitely help out, you know, uh, uh, you know, especially during summer, you know, they can, they can help out with, you know, getting the kids started. So, uh, so if, I, uh, if I were to share, so I'll ping you, I mean, do you have sure. your number? I can maybe, you know, at least ping you, Smita. Yes, yes. You just take my smita.thakur at gmail.com. You can send me an email. Okay. One second. So send you an email. You don't have a number. I have a number also. My number is four zero eight. Hold on, hold on. Let me let me 